I'm going to look at the Caesar shift cipher and how to uh, write code to accomplish uh, encrypting a message using the Caesar shift and how to decrypt it. Um, I'll just share with uh, my students uh, through Classroom a link to this uh, notebook, this Python notebook, and I'm not sure how it's going to work for you. So if you see something like this um, where you need to use this open with uh, that kind of shows you one of these things and you have to kick, click on a connected app. It was, it was created with the Google Collaboratory, which I think is their version of these Python notebooks. So just wait for this to open up. There we go. And this kind of gives a bit of the background. We looked at this already. It was a little while ago now in class, but uh, we looked at the background of what a Caesar shift is and what some of the um, what some of the uh, functions are that we need to make it work. So, um, so first of all, if you uh, recall, Caesar shift is just a way to take a message and encrypt it. And the encryption is done by um, having a key that each letter is shifted uh, in the alphabet by. So each letter in the message. So for instance, a message that has the first letter as an E might be shifted minus three. So E will become three prior in the alphabet, one, two, three, which would mean it would map to a letter B. And you can kind of see this little diagram says that. And, uh, and so in that way, if you did that for every letter in your message, it would be, you know, really difficult to read because it wouldn't make any sense at that point. You can see something happening here though. For instance, the letter D maps to the letter A. You might wonder what's going to happen if you, you know, look at the letter C with a shift of minus three, minus one, minus two, minus three. That gets you in this diagram, it's saying that it should get you to a letter Z. So that, you know, is wrapping around somehow. That's something we're going to have to look at a little later. Um, really in this video, I just want to you know, look at what the functions are that will let us perform this kind of shifting on a letter because we already know we can't really, you know, add to strings. Add is actually concatenation. Um, so if I were to look at, say, adding minus three to the letter E, I'm going to get an error. I can, I can add the string minus three to E, but again, that's concatenation. That just means take these two strings and put them together into a single string. So what we really, what we really are looking for is, you know, what, what, what is a number that corresponds to this letter? And of course, you know, the, those numbers are ask, you know, those numbers are the ASCII chart. Computers encode every letter of, uh, you know, of the, of the Latin alphabet, but of, of every alphabet, um, but in, in kind of the original form of the encoding, the ASCII table was created, and so it really just accommodates our Latin alphabet and characters and numbers, uh, punctuation and numbers. But what you'll see is the letter A, for instance, should map to the number 65. This column over here are the decimal versions of the ASCII numbers. Um, and B then is letter 66 and, and so on through the, full, the, you know, the, the whole alphabet. And so in Python, we have this function called ORD, which if you give it a letter, it will uh, return back the value that you have in the ASCII chart. So all of this is running quite slowly on my computer. I think if you were opening the um, notebook yourself, I think there might be something, it might be in a view only mode and you might have to open the playground mode, I think it said, in order to have this kind of running feature working. So you can see you can get the ASCII code for E, the number 69, and of course you could perform the shift once you have that value, you can perform the shift. How do you get back to the actual character? We have this other function called CHR, which will take that number, whatever that number is, in this case 66, and it gives back what the letter is. So let's take a look at this in, uh, in Python. So we'll start with a message like, and I'm just gonna keep it all caps for now. And let's see if we can try to deal with this entire message. So we already know that we want to, um, 
use our two new functions to do this mapping stuff. How do we do it for a whole string? Well, I have the string message. I'm going to just process it one letter at a time. So the Python for loop uh, is what I'll use here. So what does this do? It, it kind of iterates through this string message, which is hello world. It has the value hello world. That means the first, iter the first uh, iteration of the loop will grab the letter capital H and place it in this variable letter. And then it runs whatever code uh, is in the loop. Right now it's just this one print statement. And we'll see uh, this repeat for each letter in the string. So this just gives us the string hello world being printed out. Um, and let's find out what the values are of these letters as we go through. That will tell us the, the ASCII values and then we can actually perform that shift and I think the example was minus three. So what is the character after we perform the shift of that uh, of those letters? Okay, so we have the letter E and if we were to think about this for a moment, so three back from the letter H is going to give us one, two, three is going to give us the letter E, so that looks right. E is going to shift back to one, two, three, the letter B, so that looks good. And uh, you see the, the two L's coming up, both as I's there, and you know, here's the output of our message. This thing here um, was the space. So what is the uh, character in the ASCII chart that corresponds to a space? Well, that's 32. And what is the um, corresponding character when we shift it back three, this funny character here? We could look that up in the ASCII chart, but it looks like it's some kind of control character. It didn't actually print out. It seems to be a space still. So something's going on there. But in actual fact, we really only want to map letters to letters. And spaces aren't really important. And in fact, typically, a space is actually just skipped. And um, and what we, what we would end up doing is we just kind of output all of the letters. And in order to make it kind of more legible, we would just introduce a space every, say, fifth letter anyways, um, just to block it out. And then we would let the person decrypting the message deal with trying to figure out what the words are. Should be It should be readable enough without those uh, spaces in there that they should be able to figure it out. So let's try to see if we could do that. Um, you know, really, I think the best thing to do would be to kind of have a way of kind of getting this all into a single string instead of printing it each time. Then we could kind of, you know, use a function and kind of make things look a little better. So let's see if we can kind of start with a, uh, a message. Let's call it the encoded message. So it'll start as an empty string. And instead of printing it each time, let's take this new letter and let's add it to this string. So the encoded message is going to equal whatever was the encoded message previously with this new letter added on. Just as a, so there's our encoded message. There's our funny character in the middle. Let's skip it. If it's a space, space, let's just skip it. Um, we'll just do nothing. And, you know, that will, and if it's not that, then we'll uh, actually do the encoding. That'll work fine. So the encoded message should have no spaces in it now and no, no strange characters that the space actually ended up encoding to. Or maybe you would just say, if it's not a space, go ahead and process it. So maybe that would make more sense. Okay. And if this were, to, if this were going to be a, uh, you know, reusable piece of code, then let's just kind of turn it into a function. So instead of shifting it by a fixed amount, I've introduced this variable shift. So we're still seeing that encoded message there. Uh, I must have had it as three originally. I think the example was three on the 
diagram we looked at, let's turn this into a function. So we could call this Caesar shift, we could call this encode, whatever it is. Let's take a message and let's take a shift amount. And you'll notice I'm using the same variables as I had up here in my uh, global scope, right? These are globally scoped. These are going to be passed in as parameters now to my function. And that means they're locally scoped. So it's almost like you can just imagine anything inside of here as being separate from, completely separate from the variables at global scope. Okay, so this is kind of like, it's almost like it's its own copy of message or think of it as message two almost, or just think of this as, you know, being calling it something else, whatever we want to call it. Okay, so I'll run this code. It's not going to do anything. I have a message waiting to encode. I have a shift amount. What can I do? I could actually say, hey, please encode my message at my shift amount, and it returns back the string. This is, you know, a function now that's kind of giving me the encoded version of the message, and uh, it should be working. In fact, we can feed this back to our... This is the real test now, isn't it? How about a string that's called that is that, and we shift it back by uh, whatever S was, it was three, so we'll shift it back by minus three. Um, I meant to call that M, so where was it here, M? Okay, so I will call that M, and I'll encode that back minus three, and you can see that shifting back to hello world. 